Good morning, happy Sabbath to everyone. I am so happy to be back here in the beautiful Roanoke. We went to um, different places. Uh, we visit uh, the country of Colombia. And uh, I tell you, that was a really an encouraging visit that we made to this country. Uh, we spent two Sabbaths in Colombia. And the second Sabbath, we had more than 1,000 people in the auditorium that could hold about seven, 700. So we had people outside for the windows, hanging in different places, and they were all listening to the message. And they all sent greetings to the brethren here in Roanoke. So would you like to accept the greeting from the brother, brethren in Colombia? And when we departed from Colombia, that was another experience. They didn't want to let us go. They blocked the, the truck, the, the, the van that took us out, and they were singing and, and hang, waving their hands. And that was really uh, something that you, you have to see in order to describe it. So I thank the Lord for that experience. And uh, after that, we went to visit uh, Chile. We have a similar experience there. Less people, of course, but uh, similar experience. And last Monday, when finally our trip uh, was over, we, were, um, we went to the airport. Two brethren came to take us to the airport. And within a few minutes, uh, some of the brethren came to the airport. Oh, we want to say goodbye. And when we were saying goodbye to them, another group came, and another and another. So uh, many people came to the airport to say goodbye. And when we were going to the airplane, uh, they were all waving their hands and saying goodbye and sending greetings to the brethren here in, in North America. So that was a beautiful experience that we had there. And uh, it is very encouraging to know that the Holy Spirit is working marvelously in South America. So we need to pray for our brethren there. And they are also praying for North America as well. <coughs> so I'm glad to be back here and to see your faces. And as Brother Paul mentioned, um, I don't have always this privilege to be here to spend the Sabbath with our brethren here in Roanoke. But by God's grace, so this is one of the privileged days that I have. Not too many, uh, <clears throat> about a few months ago, well, about six months ago, I was traveling uh, from Los Angeles, California, with some of the brethren to the city of uh, Phoenix, <clears throat> Phoenix, Arizona. We have a nice church there in Phoenix, so we went to visit with some of the brethren. And as we were driving from Los Angeles to, to Phoenix, we went for many hours driving across the desert, you know, the wilderness. You could see from both sides and nothing but uh, sand and rocks and nothing green. And you know, I was thinking at that time, it was kind of warm weather also, and say, imagine if our car broke down here. You know, what would happen? What can we do here in the wilderness? And I remember Brother Mateus told us also that he went from, from Peru. He, dro he drove all the way to, to Chile, the city of Osorno. And he said, I went through the wilderness. That was scary, you know, to go through the wilderness for many hours and you see nothing. And I was thinking how the miracle that God performed with the people of Israel in the wilderness, in a desert place, he provided the uh, physical needs for his people. And you know, you know how God uh, provided water in this desert area for the people of Israel, but not only water, also bread. <laughs> and you know, every morning, uh, the people of Israel used to collect manna, which was in the ground freely, and they were able to go and collect it every morning. And Jesus, speaking about this manna, he mentioned that this had a symbol for the people of Israel. In the book of John, chapter 6, and I invite you to open with me your Bible, the book of John, chapter 6, and we will read verse 51. John 6, 51. 
He said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So Jesus compared himself with this manna that came down from heaven. He said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And if we also read verse 58, he said, This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your father did eat manna and are dead. So notice the difference right there. So the Israelites, they, they ate manna, but they're dead. He said that Jesus is compared with the true bread. He said, I am the living bread. And the last part said, He that eateth of this bread shall live for forever. And we need to thank the Lord because He provided not only for our physical need, but also for our spiritual need. Uh, not only bread, but also He provided water. Now, how did the, did the Lord provide the water for the people of Israel? We know the story. How? Um, let us read this in the book of Exodus. Exodus 16. Or rather, let's read 17. And we will read verse 5. 17 of Exodus. And verse 5. Okay, he said, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go and on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smartest the river, take in thy hand, and go. And verse 6, it said, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt uh, shall smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So notice this, in the wilderness, in a place that could not, uh, water could not be found, that bread could not be found, God provided for them. And that was also a symbol of Jesus Christ. In his conversation with the Samaritan woman, what did Jesus said about the water in John chapter 4. Let us read also this experience. John chapter 4 and verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> it said, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. You know, he was referring to what? To the physical water. But how about the living water? He said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So Jesus used these two illustrations, you know, manna or bread that came down from heaven was a symbol also of the true bread, which was Jesus Christ. But the same illustration is also with the water. You know, how important water is. Um, without water, we, can do, we, we cannot do much. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, speaking about that experience of the people of Israel, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, It says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was who? Was Christ. So we see that uh, the Bible explains itself. And he said that that rock was Jesus Christ, our Savior. <clears throat> In Signs of the Time, October 7, 1880. He said, The rock which smitten by the command of God sent forth his living waters was a symbol of Christ. That was the water. 
smitten and bruised, that by his blood a fountain might be prepared for the salvation of perishing men. And it's interesting that there was a prophecy in the Old Testament that spoke about that fountain, that that was, that was going to be available for everyone. In Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1, this is a prophecy about that fountain. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1. He said, In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And what is that fountain for? He said, For sins and for uncleanness. So Jesus is the fountain of water. And unfortunately, Jesus, the fountain of water, the source of supply, he was rejected. And he said, he came to his own, and his own received him not. But for those who received him, he gave him what? He gave them power to become the children of God. And in his rejection, Jesus made an illustration. Uh, in one occasion, he talked to the people, and this is found in the book of Matthew. Matthew 21. Matthew 21, and we will read verses 42. And also 43. 42, it says, Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our, our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruit thereof. So notice here that Jesus made reference to a rejection of a stone. When the temple that is called the Temple of Solomon was being erected, uh, they did something in particular. They prepared the, the, the walls, the, the, the stone, in, in another place, and they uh, prepared it in different shape and, and sides and all this. So when they came to the place of the building, they just have to lay the, the different pieces in places until the building went up. And as they were doing that, he said, an, an immense stone for the walls and the foundation were entirely prepared at the quarry. And when they were laying the foundation, he said, for the use of the foundation, one stone of unusual size and peculiar shape had been brought. But the workmen could not find a place for it and they would not accept it. And long it remained a rejected stone. But when the builders came to the lane of the corners, they searched for a long time to find a stone of sufficient size and strength and the proper shape, and they could not find it. So they have to go back again to the stone that they have rejected. And that stone was a very uh, specifically uh, to be placed in a corner so to, to carry over the whole, the whole uh, weight of the whole building. And that also Jesus made reference to be a representation of himself. He said, didn't you hear what happened? That they rejected that stone and they have to realize that they could not build. So they have to go back and find it. In the same way God has laid a foundation for his people. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, Isaiah 28 and verse 16, 
28 of Isaiah, verse 16, he said, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tri stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So in Zion, God has provided for us also a stone, a foundation. And this foundation is Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said that no one can lay another foundation which is already laid, which is who? Is Jesus Christ. It's interesting that the church was also, when Jesus said, upon this rock, I will do what? I will build my church. This is found in Matthew 16 and verse 18. Let us read that so we can refresh our mind. Matthew 16 and verse 18, he said, And I say unto, unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what rock? I will build my church, you know, the foundation that has been given us for, for many years, for eternity. He said, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And this is the secret of the assurance of God's people. Where is your foundation? He said, I lay in Zion a stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth will not perish. And the church is being built upon this rock, upon this stone. It's interesting that Christ defined himself in the following ways. He said, I am the way, <clears throat> I am the truth, and I am the life. How do we understand this? We know that there are several ways. Uh, in fact, in Proverbs 14, verse 12, he said, there is a way that seemeth what? Right unto a man, but what happened at the end? He said, at the end is the way of death. So we want to make sure that if we say that we walk in the way, we are walking in the way of Christ. And in the book of Matthew also is mentioned two ways, the narrow way and also the broad way. You know, the narrow way represents Christ because Jesus said, if, if anyone will come after me, what, what are we supposed to do? take us across, which is a symbol of the narrow way. You know, you have to take the cross before you receive a crown. And, but many Christians today, they go in the wrong way. What would happen when you drive in the wrong way? Huh? <laughs> if the police catch you on time, you know, you may have no problem just to pay a ticket. But if another vehicle may collide with you, then you are in trouble. You know, so um, we have to make sure that when we say we are in Christ, we are in the narrow way. You know, we walk in the, in the, in the narrow way. Because the broad way, which is an easy way, is also a symbol of the world. The world. And the Apostle James said that the friendship with the world is what? is enmity with God. So it's very easy to recognize the church that is in the sure foundation. It's very easy to recognize. How? You know, the moment that you see the world creeping into the church, what is uh, the sign for? You say that means we are going away from the foundation because Jesus said, I am the way. And Jesus cannot be the broad way. He is the narrow way. So as Christians, we must uh, examine ourselves daily to see whether if we are in the faith. The moment that our feelings, that our, our tendency are going after the world, that's a, you know, this is very dangerous. We have to make sure that the church is built and is staying in the foundation, which is, Jesus Christ. But Jesus is also the truth. He's not only the way. He is also the truth. 
And what would the truth do to an, to an individual? Or how important the truth is? How important? Um, in John 17, 17, it says the purpose for the truth, uh, sanctify them, where? Yeah, 17, you, you know this third text by, by heart. It says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is true. So the truth has been given us for a specific purpose. And that purpose is sanctification. But not only to have it as a theory. You know, we may have the theory of the truth, you know, like uh, being born in the church, for example. Um, we were talking about in Chile about, you know, the difference between being born in the church and the church being born in your heart. And, uh, and a question was asked to a young person, you know, where were you born? He said, I was born in the hospital. Yeah, but she was born in the, in the church, you know, but she understood the message that uh, you may be born in the church, but if the truth is not in your heart, you know, it's not, it doesn't profit you. So because of that, God has given us the truth. And in this last day specifically, the truth has been revealed to us fully. He said, the most solemn message given to mortal is being given to these people. Amen. For what purpose? He said to sanctify it. And in First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-two. First Peter one, verse twenty-two. He said, "Seeing ye have purified your souls, in what?" in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So the truth is given us to sanctify, to purify. So when you say you are in the foundation, you are in Christ, you know, you have to identify this characteristic. Because today there are so many people claiming to be God's church. And how can we make the difference? How can we prove that we are the church of God? It is only if we follow the way, if we are in the narrow way, and if we are in the truth and we practice the truth. And, you know, there, are, there will not be the, the hearers of the word, but the doers of the word that will be faithful to the Lord. And in... <laughs> the, the enemy is trying to introduce some false doctrine of error in the true church of God. Um, now, but how much can we be connected as a church with error? How much can we be? In, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 21, 1 John 2 verse 21 he said, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. And notice this. And that no lie is of the truth. So there is no connection between the truth and lie or error, in other words. So when we claim to be in the foundation, we must make sure that we have no connection with false doctrines or oh, error, or oh, no lie, as he mentioned here. He says that no lie is of the truth. And this is uh, very important. Now, we can spend, you know, times and times speaking about life. Jesus said, this is life eternal, that you may know. You know, but how can we know God? This is a process. If you want to know the, uh, God truly, uh, there is a guideline given in the second chapter of Peter. You know, how we go and ascending in a process and being, and so we can get the knowledge of God. You know, we, need, we must add to our faith virtue. And then to virtue, knowledge, and so on. Sister White said that once you have, when you receive the faith, our next work 
is to add virtue of our life. If we don't do that, the heart cannot be prepared to receive the knowledge of God, which is what? Eternal life. Hmm? So if we follow these steps here, Jesus the way, the truth and the life, then we will be in the sure foundation. In, uh, sometimes we get discouraged. Our faith, our waver, and we uh, sometimes uh, uh, get to doubt. Or we move, our feelings change from time to time. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Verse 19, the Apostle Paul gave us the assurance. 2 Timothy 2, 19, he said, Nevertheless, the foundation of God extended what? Sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So brethren, there is no problem with the church of God. You know, I have found that many people, when they leave the, our church, they begin blaming the church. Oh, the church didn't do this, the church didn't do that. Brethren, the foundation of God is right there. It stands it stand sure, it says here. We may, we waver, we change, we go after different things. But the foundation is being laid, and no one can lay another foundation. It's only Jesus Christ. That is why we have to look upon Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. If we look upon our brethren, if we look upon my sister, my mother, my, uh, my brother, we may go astray. Amen. But the Lord said that we are to be found upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ. In one occasion, the Apostle Paul went to preach to a place uh, called Mars. And he knew that that place was uh, surrounded by, by many educated people. He said, well, you know, he tried to look and uh, to do something different in this place because he were going to face uh, educated individuals. And he said, in Review and Herald, July 19, 1887, Sister White wrote about that experience that he had. He said, uh, he met logic with logic, philosophy with philosophy, learning with learning, and oratory with oratory. So he tried to face these people in their level. And he forgot for a moment that there is a foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And he said, at the end of his labors, he looked at the result and could see only three who had been benefited. Only three people were benefited. Because what? He said, well, I have to meet these people in their ground. They're educated individuals. I have to hit them with their, their own weapons. Logic with logic, philosophy with philosophy, learning with learning. And at the end, he saw very little result. And after that, uh, he made a resolution. He said, he decided that henceforth he would maintain the simplicity of the gospel. Amen. And it's true, brethren, the gospel is simple. It's very simple. It just takes understanding. And he said, he would preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is our, our science. This is our philosophy. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And this is our foundation. The moment you go uh, to look for another foundation, uh, you fail. It's very easy to fail. The Apostle Paul said that we, as a members of the church, we are to build upon that foundation. He said, I have laid the, the, the foundation. I gave, it, I gave you Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 20 and 21.
He said, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building filthily framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habit or an habitation of God through the Spirit. So we have also the, a duty to do. Once we are in the faith, once we are in the foundation, we are to grow and build. And this is the, our character that we are to build. Mm. Uh, in Desire of Ages, page 314, Desire of Ages, page 314, he said, it is not enough, he said, for you to hear my words. By obedience, you must make them the foundation of your character. So what are we supposed to do with the Word of God? He said, the Word of God is not just to be appreciated and say, look, this is a... No, he said, you must make it the foundation of your character to live with the Word of God, to, to act like the Word of God. And it's interesting that referring to the same, the same application in Matthew chapter 7, the book of Matthew, the chapter 7, uh, verse 24, Verse 24 says, Therefore, whosoever heareth this saying of mine, and doeth them, I will liken them, liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And I, here's the illustration again. Build the house upon a rock. And what happened then? And the rain descended, and the flood came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house. And what happened? He fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Brethren, I can guarantee you, if your faith is found upon the rock, you will never fall. This is clear. He said, the rain may descend, the storm may come, the flood came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house. You know, it doesn't mean that it didn't beat upon the house. It tried to to move it. But he said, and he fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. Amen. So you may have trials, you may have, you may see whatever you, what is the worst that you may see. But if you are founded upon the rock, brethren, you will never fall. It doesn't matter what my wife, my, my children, what my uh, co-workers do. If I am founded upon the rock, your house which is your faith will not fall. And the next illustration is uh, verse 26 is the opposite. He said, And everyone that heareth the saints of mine and doeth them not. So what, what is the problem then when we fail? He said, he said uh, continue, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the flood came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and he fell. And great was the fall of it. And, he, and, and so on. So, brethren, this is our assurance here. It's not just to say, you know, we are in the foundation, this is the church of God, this is the true, this is not. Brethren, are we upon the foundation, which is Jesus Christ? Then we will not fall. It's interesting that now, after this uh, catastrophe that happened in Asia, people are afraid to live close to the sea. You know, we went to a place called uh, uh, Port, Puerto Montt in Chile, and we went to visit a sister that lived right there in the shore of the sea. And uh, for some reason, someone mentioned the tsunami. They said, oh, don't mention that here in this place because people are afraid now. Hmm? And, and it's written in the Bible. I remember after September 11, I was in Tennessee when uh, the day after September 11, one uh, 
how do you call these people, homeless. One homeless left a big pack, a big uh, something in a place, and he left. And because of that, people thought that that was a, a, a bomb. And they called the special people to come and try to, and you see the television trying to see, and many people evacuated because they thought that that was a bomb. And why is that, brethren? The Bible said that people will flee without no one to persecute them. And if we are founded upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ, we have nothing to fear. We are in the sure foundation, and it says that the, that foundation is firm and will not fall. So, brethren, the Apostle Paul, rather the Apostle Peter in the first epistle, and we read this verse uh, at the beginning, about that foundation. And it's been prophesied for years in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. He said, I lay in sound a true foundation. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and reading from uh, 6 to 8, he said, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is the precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders dis disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And verse 8, and a stone of stumbling. Notice this, you know. And a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So the foundation, when we are supposed to build our house to be strong, to be secure, for many, he said, it will be a stumbling block. How can we understand that? You know, it will be a stumbling block. And Jesus made another appeal to the people in his time. And this appeal is not only for the people in Jesus' time, but also unto us as well. In the book of Matthew, chapter 21, Matthew 21, and we will read, we read already uh, verses 42 and 43. Now let us read verse 44. Matthew 21, verse 44, it said, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whosoever he shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So brethren, here's the two options we have. Either we fall upon the rock and be broken, and now when you, when you hear be broken and fall upon a rock, you think that this is maybe a tragedy, you know. But it is interesting that God dwells in people of the broken spirit. So, and he said, he that fall upon the rock is broken, but whosoever that the rock shall fall on him, he said, it will grind him to powder. Now, what does he mean to fall upon the rock and be broken? What does he mean? In Desire of Ages, page 599, he says, to fall upon the rock and be broken is to give up our self-righteousness and to go to Christ with the humility of a child, repenting of our transgression and believing in his forgiving love. So let me repeat this to you. What is to fall upon the rock and be broken? He said, it is to give up our self-righteousness. And this is our dangerous, our danger, brethren. Uh, 
We know that uh, we live in the Laodicean period. And the Laodicean, the tendency of the Laodicean is to say, look, I have enough, I am rich, I have the knowledge, I have uh, the truth, so I need nothing. That is self-righteousness. And is to the Laodicean, the Lord invites them to fall upon the rock and be broken, okay, which, is, which means to give up the self-righteousness and come to Christ with the humility of a child. Now, what is the condition of many? In, in volume 5, page 218, <coughs> the, it describes here the condition of many people. <coughs> it says, many have accepted the theory of the truth who have, who have not true conversion. So is it possible to receive just a theory of the truth, but they have not been converted? Now, what is the help of that? No, that person he said, I will compare them with him, a foolish man, that built his house upon a sand, and the wind blow, and the tempest come, and he fell, because it was not founded upon the rock. He said, many have accepted the theory of the truth, who have had no true conversion. There are few who feel true sorrow for sin. The heart of stone is not exchanged for a heart of flesh. Few are willing to fall upon the rock and be broken. So few are willing. You know, that's not an easy thing. But keep in mind that if we don't fall upon the rock, then the rock will fall upon us. <clears throat> Uh, I would close with uh, a couple of thoughts here from the, the words of David, the psalmist. In Psalm 34, verse 18, Psalm 34, verse 18, he said, The Lord is night unto them that are of a broken heart. Notice this. You may think that to fall upon the rock and be broken is a tragedy. But he said, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. So this is, brethren, this is the experience that the Lord wants to see in us. And also in Psalm 51, 51, and verses 16 and 17. He said, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So, brethren, Jesus invited his people. He said, to those who believe, to those who have accepted Christ, he said, he is a sure foundation. These are they who fall upon the rock and are broken. So brethren, as we have seen uh, the illustration of Christ throughout the whole Bible, uh, without that experience, we may not go too far. When the winds blow, when the tempests come, uh, something may, may happen to our spiritual house, may fall, brethren. It is time to seek the Lord today that He may be found. It is time to open our heart. It is time to come and be humble and to fall upon the rock and renounce our self-righteousness and allow Christ to live within us. So may God help us that we may all experience these things in our life. This is my wish and prayer. Amen. Amen. Most gracious and loving Father, we thank you so much for being with us today, for giving us thy Holy Spirit, for giving us thy word. We pray, Father, that everyone may have a new experience with Jesus Christ as we fall upon the rock. 
as we stand upon the foundation which has been laid for many centuries and centuries, Father, we don't know for how long the grace will be open to everyone. But we pray, Father, that everyone may take advantage of this time to recommit our life to Thee, that we may make a new resolution in our life Amen. to speak about Christ, to allow Him in our hearts, to practice His humble, humbleness, His meekness may be reflected in everyone. We pray for our young people that they may also understand that, that the re few days that remain in this probation time may not be extended for too long. Amen. And bless our children, bless every parent here, that we may raise them according to thy will. And we also pray for all thy children throughout the world, the brethren in South America, in North America, in Asia, all thy children are spread in different parts of this world. We pray, Father, that we may consecrate our lives and be able to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, that we may go and proclaim the loud cry that Christ has power to save us, and we may be saved through him. We ask all these things not because we uh, desire anything, but just in the merit of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.